I think you want to pull up your mic and look this it's probably... Is that better? Then no. Is that okay? Yes, okay. Uh, so, I'm going to be discussing analog gravity and in using the analog gravity framework in systems that previously we were not able to use this analog gravity framework to derive an analog metric. Uh, so because I don't think most people here have worked on analog gravity or know much about analog gravity, I'm going to spend a lot of time explaining what this is, uh, why I think it's an interesting subject to work on, and then why we would want to generalize the assumptions made in deriving an analog metric. So, okay, the origins of analog gravity really go back as far as the 1920s uh, to people like Gordon and Moncrief who were considering fluids moving in uh, non-trivial space-time, say around <coughs> stars. But the real modern implementation of this idea came with uh, Bill Unruh. And what he was doing was he was giving a talk uh, back in the 1970s, and he was trying to explain what a black hole was. So this was about the time people were really realizing that black holes were interesting astrophysical objects and were starting to take them seriously. Uh, and he was trying to explain how to visualize a black hole. And he said, OK, imagine you've got some blind fish in a river. Now they cannot communicate by light because they're blind, and so they're communicating by sound waves. But if this river is a particularly violent one, and at some point there's a big waterfall such that the speed of this waterfall goes above the speed of sound in the river, then you get a sound horizon. That's what a black hole is like. We can't propagate the light outside this black hole. It's like you cannot propagate the sound outside something that goes above the velocity going above the speed of sound. Uh, so this is this is just words at the moment. This is just something you say to try and get the point across. Uh, the realization is that you can actually frame this into a mathematical statement <coughs> and start trying to get information from this. So the very simplest implementation of this is exactly putting this case into equations. So you know that with respect to this fish that's standing still in the river, he can emit a sound wave in a certain direction. But another fish standing still in this river is going to measure the velocity of this wave, where this is the unit normal, depending on the direction the sound wave is emitted. That just by Galilean relativity, this is the same. Very simple physics. But you can rearrange this a little bit, and you're going to define what is a sound cone, really. Now, the point about having a sound cone is that almost all the information we have encoded into a metric is precisely held in a light cone. The only other piece of missing information we have, because this has all the information we might ever want on things like causality, uh, and relation between events, but we don't have any information about volume. So just by the existence of a sound cone, we have information that effectively <coughs> you have a metric, a class of metrics, that's undetermined by a conformal factor. Now the thing to note here is that 
even though we started with Galileo relativity, what we've got, say, set this velocity to zero, we're going to have minus CS111 down here. So you've got a Lorentzian metric. And that just comes about because we put a limiting speed, uh, which happens to be the speed of sound. So this is, uh, this is very general, this sort of approach. I mean, you can do Galilean relativity on everything, and you can come up with something like this. What we would really want is something a little bit stronger before we can say anything about uh, anything particularly useful. And what we're going to want is, we are going to want a wave equation on a curved metric. And this will really allow us to start studying kinematic effects on a curved background. <coughs> also for some purposes we would really like to know exactly what that conformal factor is. Uh, and we would like a framework in which we understand where, uh, how, in what regime our equations are valid and when and how they break down. So this is going into the regime of what we, what we call physical acoustics. And we're going to uh, go to a system uh, where we're going to derive an equation for a scalar field on a curved background, which is describing perturbations around some system. Uh, so I would like to stress, despite the name, analog gravity is really not gravity. Uh, this is curved spacetimes. This is studying curvature and the effects of curved spacetimes that happen in this case to be something we know as an effective curved spacetime and not something we consider a fundamental aspect of the theory, which in gravity we consider in it well, we understand that we think something breaks down at quantum scales, but we really consider that curvature is a fundamental key component of the equations and of the theory. Here, we're working with things like Bose-Einstein condensates, and we're just creating an effective curved metric. So, if this is not gravity, what is this going to tell us is the key point. So, really, it's key in allowing us to theoretically and experimentally explore both classical and semi-classical effects on a curved space-time. Now, this is interesting because some of the effects, the exotic effects that we consider to be gravitational effects, say Hawking radiation or cosmological path production, really are not gravitational effects. They are curved space-time effects. There is only kinematics involved in their derivation. If you set up a black hole solution of some form, you're going to start getting these effects. And this is particularly interesting because now, when I'm thinking in the gravitational sector, I have no idea what the UV completion is. I don't know how that's going to affect the equations I'm deriving, especially for something like Hawking radiation where at some point in your calculations you have very large energies coming in. But I do know the UV completion of water or of a Bose-Einstein condensate. And so this allows a theoretical exploration of how something like does UV physics come into these sorts of calculations and if so, in what manner. So we've managed to answer some useful questions this way. The other interesting thing is really from an experimental point of view. Uh, it's somewhat difficult to set up a gravitational black hole in your laboratory, and I don't want to think how you would get it through the relevant authorities for approval. But you can set up a flow in your laboratory, and with certain fluids and with certain systems, you can set up a realistic analog of a black hole, or sometimes a white hole in your laboratory. People do these experiments now. So this is a way to get a tabletop laboratory experiment on effects that people tend to think of as gravitational. 
So I'm going to be discussing Bose-Einstein condensates. Now these are from a laboratory point of view. Very nice systems because if you want to directly measure anything sort of semi-classical, what you're going to have to have is something with very little noise at extremely low temperatures and a high level of quantum coherence. And also you would really like a low speed of sound because this is going to determine the size of your experiment. Uh, and really the only good candidates for such a direct uh, observation are going to be these Bose-Einstein condensates. Uh, I'm not an experimentalist, so from my point of view it's just a fairly good, theoretically clean system that I can play with. So we were having this before. We're going to describe our Bose-Einstein condensates by the Gross Pitovsky, Pitalski, I'm not sure how you say that name, <laughs> equation, which is this Schrodinger equation uh, plus some potential, and then we've got this uh, self interaction term. So it's sort of a non linear Schrodinger equation. This equation is, I think you would have noticed from the previous talk, somewhat difficult to solve mostly due to the self-interaction term. Uh, so the good thing in the self-interaction term is related to the, the scattering length of modes moving back and forth. Uh, so this is hard to solve, and the good thing is we don't have to solve it, because what we're interested in is studying the perturbations moving on a background <coughs> that solves this equation. So, this is just, I'm, got, I'm not going to go into the mathematical details too much, but I'm going to explain the procedure that we're just going to take a background field approach and we're going to split it into something that solves this equation plus a perturbation on top of that. And we can get a linearized equation for what the perturbation has to obey. Uh, we're going to get a speed of sound coming in here, which will be key. And then we're going to re-express this background just decomposing it in terms of the phase and the um, amplitude. And we're going to define this velocity, which is going to be the derivative of this phase. Now, we can take the equation for the perturbations and multiply it by the Hermitian conjugate to get a nicer equation. And then we can manipulate it a bit to get into this form but we're going to get this uh, quantum potential term. And since you've got two of these, what this quantum potential term does is it adds higher order derivatives into your equation. And these higher order derivatives are going to come out in your dispersion relation. And so when these terms are large, this is what is going to destroy your metric picture because you're going to have higher order terms in your dispersion relation, and that's your UV effects coming in. Uh, so then we can really rearrange the equations, and we're going to have to use the continuity equation on the Bose-Einstein condensate to rewrite this in a nice form. And what you can do is you can stare at this equation for a few minutes and say, okay, uh, this kind of looks like we can recast it into this form. And actually what physically comes in as more significant is the metric density <coughs> rather than the metric itself. But you can really just compare back and forth between this equation and this equation and write down this form. Now, this is exactly the same form as what we had from the simple geometric acoustic uh, scalar and relativity argument. But in the background, we have this equation. So we know actually uh, the wave equation of this perturbation on the background. We've got the conformal factor. And because we know at which wavelengths this uh, quantum potential starts to become significant, we have an idea of what scales we can use these equations at and when and how it begins to break down.
linear dispersion relation. And this is what comes out as the speed of sound here, if you recalculate that. But you're also, from expanding at, you can look at various limits of this equation. So in the Fagnocchi paper, they're taking things like both examining the gap and the gapless modes, and they're taking uh, ultra relativistic limits and non, -rel and non relativistic limits and low energy limits. What we're interested in is these low energy gapless modes, primarily for understanding this metric. And so, there, from expanding this out at low momentum, you're going to get this extra term. So, you know, to have a simple metric formulation, you're going to have to keep this term small. So that really tells you at what scale new corrections are coming up. So, yes, we're concerned with the low momentum massless modes. And for this, we can neglect the quantum potential. And we can rewrite the equation of the perturbation, casting it into this form here. And again, you can look at that and you can read off that this is like form of a scalar equation in a curved metric. And you can just read that off after a bit of manipulation to be of this form. Now this isn't the Klein-Gordon equation in the flat metric plus interaction we had before. This is now a Klein-Gordon equation with no interaction term in a curved metric. You can cast this in a slightly more convenient way um, to express this in terms of a normalized normalized with respect to the background Minkowski metric uh, velocity. And you hear you've got the speed of sound coming in. So this is what you would get if you take, say, a relativistic perfect fluid and do the uh, equations for that as well. Now, I put vorticity in my title, uh, so it's probably about time I mention vorticity and what relevance it has. So we have implicitly set the vorticity of this flow to zero simply by the definition we were taking for this fall velocity or this free velocity, because we've explicitly put it as the derivative of a scalar. So automatically everything is zero. So this in and of itself would not at all worry me in, a, in an analog system. It's just a particular system we have taken and the vorticity in the system happens to be zero. That's the nature of the system. Except it's not just this system. So one of the other very popular systems to play with is just looking at sound waves in a perfect fluid. And this is one of the simplest things you can do. So for this system also, to derive a wave equation for this, you have to make three key assumptions. That the flow is in viscid, that it's barotropic, and that it's vorticity free. Now, these barotropic and vorticity free are related because it looks like you can induce vorticity by adding a small non-barotropic term to your equation. But even in the BC case, yes. if you have a uh, topological defect, like in one direction, yes, like if, a, uh, that's sort of a cosmological one line frame. similarity, where yes. it is normal matter, not BC, then theta can be singular, and okay. then you can have vorticity. What is it? Exactly like, uh, cosmic strings or magnetic monopole, you know, you can have a multiply connected. So the key point is not whether you can have vorticity in a vector, it's whether you, can you derive metric once you have that. And I think if you've got a discontinuity, you're suddenly going to have it a will singular like a cosmic velocity. String. Yeah. Okay, yeah, people play with cosmic strings, but on the, on the string, your descriptions, on the string, your description breaks down. Yeah. So, so outside the string, you have the normal condensate wave yes. function is yes. non-zero, but along the string, you have condensate wave function is zero. Yeah. So then, your theta is singular along yes. this line, and then even <coughs> with u mu as proportional to the gradient of theta, you can still have what is. 
uh, like, like in the case of superfluids. Point. In superfluids, you can, although superfluid, which doesn't have any holes, what is, it is, there's no vorticity, it's irrotational. But if you have normal fluid lines, you can have vorticity. Okay, so for that, if you're, you get this discontinuity in your veins, yes? Okay. And then you're going to have this velocity flow jumping to infinity. So I know there is a way you can describe at least the region outside a cosmic string in this analog framework. But I think something's going to fail right on the point with the description in terms of a metric right on that cosmic string. It does. It is not a metrical. This is a string in the theta, the wave function. Yeah. Then it is Nielsen also in vortex. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. exactly. But also you can have skirmions in this model. Okay. Skirmions I'm not very familiar with those. So. This is an abelian thing, right? Can you what a psi is a complex uh, skirmions is something yeah, non abelian, right? Yeah, yeah, there is a q1. 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 You put two 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 um, You need two sheets or something. Right? Two flavors, then you will have a right. internal index and you will have skirmions. So people play with multi-component fluids, but yeah. I'm not too familiar with Not how really. this works. There is literature on this. But what is it? It is not. Otherwise, you will get cos. What is it? The, 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 the cosmic yes. string. But so here, there is not the metric in the side. Yeah. The cosmic string metric normally has an angle deficit. Yes. So you might uh, find something like yes. that here. Very also. interesting. It might be the case. I, I do know there are people who mean you can do a cosmic string model. Yeah. And I think right at the string you get something going weird, but you can still yeah. the area outside. Yeah, exactly. It, it, the circle is not twice far. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, yes, if you're playing with these uh, sound waves in perfect fluid, for instance, you're also going to have to assume you've got vorticity free. You have to assume in viscid too, but we really understand where that assumption is coming from because if you've got viscosity in your system you're going to have uh, energy loss from your perturbation and so this has been studied before and what you have to do is you have to make sure the time scale of your experiment or the length scale of your experiment is small compared to the time loss scale due to viscosity so you just have to keep those terms sufficiently small this However, in the perfect fluid case, you don't really have this, okay, what if we put an epsilon velocity <coughs> in this fluid? Just a small amount. So, and you don't really see the physical reason necessarily why it's necessary to set this to zero for these equations. And physically what's happening. So, someone has, some people have tried to work this out before, actually. And this is uh, Bigliatha and others. And what they do is they <coughs> make a departure from a barotropic equation, which induces vorticity. And then they have to go through quite a complicated mathematical setup. Uh, and they do get to a metric description, but they have this extra risk constraint on it because what comes into when your metric picture breaks down is not just energy scales or time scales it's going to be the ratio of the frequencies of this vorticity and the sound wave uh, frequency so that's quite a new kind of restriction and constraint on your system uh, and as I said, there's this quite convoluted construction. So uh, what we did, in fact, what we stumbled across by accident when we were trying to do something completely different, uh, was, okay, there's a much, much, much simpler way to do this. And it's obvious in hindsight and it's physically clear, which is, okay, we're going to take our bosine state commutator <coughs> and we're just going to couple an electromagnetic and you can probably already see where this is going. So you can redo uh, 
all the equations, you're gonna you're gonna be wanting to work really with charged bosons here. So you couple your electromagnetic field, minimally coupled, and you're just gonna have to work out your equation for your perturbations. And again, you, you do your decomposition and you express the demand along representation as perturbation. So uh, you're going to define exactly in the same way all your parameters as you did in this relativistic post Einstein condensate case. So none of these definitions have changed. And now you can re express the perturbation equation in terms of this combined object where we're taking uh, the four velocity plus this vector potential. You can, and now this is identical up to this is a different object. And the key point is you've also got this shift in your conserved current. So that you can rewrite everything in terms, just in terms of this F vector instead of this four velocity. And we get right back to the same result, we now we've written in terms of F, then in terms of U. So this is incredibly basic. So, so what is F mu now? This F mu, how is it F defined? F mu is defined like okay. this. So mm -hmm. for velocity, charge, and vector potential. So explicitly, uh, Explicitly, the system is going to contain vorticity as long as we've got a non-zero field stream. And if you if you charge something and you couple an electromagnetic field to it, this is incredibly obvious and incredibly simple compared to what people have done before. So we can just return to our slightly more familiar system with our non-relativistic Bose-Einstein condensate either by explicitly coupling or by taking the limit from the non-relativistic case. So the vorticity is in F mu now or in U mu? F mu. It's in F mu. So it's but not this in is the, the relevant mechanical, current. it's not in the mechanical velocity. Yes, but this is the relevant conserved current, conserved flow. It's topologically conserved. <coughs> uh, so now we can think in terms of our minimally coupled non-relativistic Bose-Einstein compensate and redo everything again, splitting perturbation and such, and rewriting our continuity equation to get to this, which is exactly what we had before with instead of V, we now have F. And it's incredibly obvious that this is going to exactly be proportional to your magnetic field. If you get a charge flow, you're going to start moving things and you're going to get things rotating. So that is uh, what we've done. And the basic idea here is that <coughs> Part of the value in this analog gravity framework is we can do this for so many systems. So it's really key to understand if we put a restraint in our system, is that going to be something key physically? Or is this just a, a mathematical simplicity thing that often will help if we don't need it? <coughs> uh, so this, I think we can say that the vorticity free is just, in many cases, a mathematical simplicity rather than something really key to emerging an analog metric. And what this gives us is, okay, partly this allows us, while to potentially uh, incorporate some new metrics in, because it gives us one more freedom in what our velocity is going to, uh, velocity flow, we get one less restriction. And so potentially we can model new and possibly physically interesting metrics. We haven't had much success on this aspect yet, but that is one possibility. 
and we also understand where this assumption, why is this assumption useful or not? Is it a key physical assumption and it looks like no. Uh, and we've done it in an incredibly easy way actually. So this is the key point that we've managed to get rid of a restriction in an incredibly simple and physically clean manner. So I'll just actually leave you with a number of, if you guys are interested at all in blowing up, a number of references. Our paper, this relativistic Bose Einstein condensate for analog gravity paper, uh, the previous work on vorticity and analog systems, and this is what I would say is the best general background to uh, start from if you're interested in analog gravity more generally. So, thank you. Any questions at the back? Uh, uh, have this been being considered in this context? Because dissipation will give you some explicit terms for the entropy, and since you're using perfect fluids, I was just wondering if this bit of terms have been considered uh, in the fluid consideration. Dissipation is. You know, if you're talking about BEC, there is no dissipation. Yeah, yeah there is. You, you, you can. If you obviously, you're going to have some once you get the scattering it, term, but it's going to be generically small. <coughs> Just a remark, this is very much like a type 2 superconductor. Yes. Conductor. yes. Yes. So you can form crystals of vortices. They are known, very well known in experiment in the Curtis matter. So here also they will form for some parameters. Not a vortices and they will form like crystal and arrangements. In terms of the extended range of... It's not like a solid. Uh, it will no, repel, no. but uh, it is in a finite world we say. They have to rearrange somehow and they will form the crystal. Okay. For some parameters of yeah. the superconductor. Um, uh, uh, I have a question. See, uh, I try to understand things in your. Uh, I told you that the creativity and I was looking at this thing. So, um, from two points of view. So, one of these that you use the Bradley transformation, you use then this uh, phi is equal to change, and you get the fluid equation. Yes. You look at the concept of quantities. And then I can easily recipe the find out the geometry. Huh? Yes. Two things are there. First, if you look at the iconal equation that is going on, playing with the role. This iconal equation, if you go back, then it is basically the uh, it comes to the uh, the farmer's list actions. Uh, you know the ray optics. Yes. Okay. Right. Now you can. That's the first definition from the uh, iconal. Yeah. Now you do the variational calculus. I mean, all upon current. And you get into the uh, business, how you can actually see, this is basically sometimes it's coming out to be Euler equation of fluid, that I mean, you know, fluid equation. Okay, yes. <laughs> so, and that's why, you know, you, some, if you do the Hamiltonian approach, go to the Clef's Gordon, Clef's potential, you can use it, Clef's potential, extra potential, you can do this uh, in the one way, otherwise you can do this what is it is around this thing, but it's uh, uh, all this thing. So do you, can you shed a light on this kind of things? Because if you think about it, uh, if you so you're saying think about this in terms of the Clebsch potential. It's a, it's a one. Yeah. It's a Hamilton. I think the question is true. So you need to think about the more than I was asking. Let's let's talk later. Okay. What is the experimental status of the analog? Okay, so one or two. it's it's active and uh, developing, and so in terms of like people, what people like Una and Weinberg have done is they've set up these wave tanks where they're uh, setting up white hole systems, and they're measuring actually some sort of super radiance term from there. So they're extracting from classical aspects and extrapolating that this applies quantum uh, aspects. So that last step, I would like a direct something, which you need the Bose-Einstein condensate for me. And I think experimentally, the control and the, the temperatures are just a little bit too, 
too too high, too much noise at the moment, but it's it's conceivable that within 10 years maybe. So I don't know anyone directly doing these Bose-Einstein condensate, but they're, they're paying attention to what people are saying from this community, and I think some people have it in the back of their mind. In the meantime, there's a lot of indirect uh, detection of these sorts of stuff. So UMRA is one, there's people playing with uh, variations of refractive index along a fiber optic cable. There's a lot of different systems people are thinking of and playing with. Okay, thanks. I think so, uh, last question over there. Yeah. I have a question. Is there any derivation of a post in this Diagnostic effective metric, which you showed me, uh, with fermionic matter? Fermionic matter? I don't know. I, I, if we really have to relate this to Hawking radiation, Hawking radiation is universal. Ah, you, you want an effective, not the Klein Gordon for a scalar, you want a fermion yeah. equation. Yes. So you need to take slightly different sorts of perturbations. Uh, I don't think anyone has done an autofermion case, but I wouldn't swear by that. In that case, we'd love to start with a super uh, yeah. equation. You, you and from the super equation, super metal transformation, I can show you the example. I will talk to you later. But there has to be his close the chair. Can't 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 the chair. Can